Welcome. This is Alistair Knott. I've got a special guest tonight. She has a YouTube channel called The Lunar Fairy Witch, where she talks about witchcraft, spirituality, and the occult. She has a very active TikTok for those that like TikTok. Uh, an Instagram as well, where she shares a lot of her personal pictures. Uh, she is a host on a podcast called The Infernal Alchemy. She also has an Etsy shop, Magic Moon and Mystery. My guest tonight is the Lunar Fairy Witch, Viv. Viv, thank you for taking time to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. So how long have you been on the left-hand path? So I started practicing witchcraft in general about a decade ago. Um, and then I started kind of, my path started kind of shifting kind of gradually. So it wasn't a, a one event or one major shift. So I'd say it's been about four or five years. So about the second half of my practice is where it slowly began shifting into what I've got going on now and kind of developing into what really resonates with me and what works for me. And how did you come about being on the left-hand path? How did you find your way? For me, it was a lot of soul searching. It was a lot of working through um, sort of the views I, I may have had before the um, I feel like a lot of people after they leave Christianity or, you know, whatever religion they were raised in, um, they leave that religion, but they still kind of have some holdovers from it. So for me, it was really working through those and working through that sort of fear that had been instilled in terms of that sort of thing. Um, and then really just becoming intrigued um with that sort of side of things hearing about uh, demonolatry was a big one where I saw I came across some practitioners and luciferianism working with Lilith especially Lilith was the first really the first spirit on the left hand path that I started working with because she really was calling to me and really intriguing me um and I definitely credit her for really bringing me on to this path I see. And so would you say Lilith is your favorite to work with? I would say, um, I would say it, ha it would have to be Lilith and Hikate are the two kind of beings that have, they've really been such incredible forces to work with in, in their own different ways, just really such primordial, powerful, like empowering kind of energies, but at the same time, they've taught me so much about myself, about the world, about um, just everything around me. Um, I've recently been working with the Hecateon and working really heavily with Hecate, and I've really felt some changes internally um, in, in the most positive way possible since then. And I just feel like Lilith and Hecate are the most incredible <laughs> beings I've ever worked with, if I'm honest. So most belief systems have core beliefs. So can you share a little bit about what your core beliefs are? Absolutely. So my practice could be described as pretty eclectic. So in terms of um, my core beliefs, it's kind of drawn from various sources and internally as well. But uh, generally, I have these kind of principles of um, keeping the peace whenever you can but um, sometimes violence is necessary as a way of, you know, fighting an oppressor or whatever that may be. Um, another thing is definitely uh, have a very strong nature uh, based practice as well. Um, so taking care of the earth is very important to me, sustainability, taking care of the earth respecting the land, which is something that I feel is being lost. Um, these days, it's something that's very rare nowadays where, you know, I go to a, a local uh, trail, local park, and it's littered. And um, I'll always take trash bags with me and at least try to try to pick up the mess and clean up the sort of crap that people have left behind. Um, and um, I, I feel that 
they're often uh, so so for me, my views are not super black and white. So it's like um, I wouldn't call myself a moral relativist, but I would say somewhere in between where I think there are certain things that are universally um, bad. So, you know, murdering, uh, I don't know, an innocent person. Obviously, I don't stand for that. But then there are instances where their, um, you know, self-defense or in some cases, revenge. I mean, there, there are certain things where I feel like morality can be more malleable. Um, but um, I'm stuff definitely still discovering my core values as I go on in my practice. Um, I'm currently taking a philosophy class and that's had me thinking a lot about these sort of things in terms of what arguments can we use to justify this sort of stance? And then is it sound? Is it a valid argument? And then sometimes you find that the things you really believed, the arguments that are used for them aren't as valid and sound as you thought. So that's been a really interesting um, journey for me. So I have a feeling that after I finish this course, I might have changed uh, my stance on a few things. Yeah, I enjoyed taking philosophy many, many, many years ago. Um, it, it it gave me one thing. It taught me how to put together a premise and, and a theory, and then how to defend that or how to first project it to explain it. And uh, so it was really valuable. Uh, I really like that. So on your website, you have a lot of really great videos, how-to videos. You do a lot with implements of the trade, like candles and, and things like that. Do you offer any services? Some people do readings and things like that. Do you offer any of those? Um, so I currently don't offer readings um, or spell work other than my Etsy shop, although that's more of a physical, tangible goods and stuff. But um, I am considering uh, starting up in, in, a, in a little bit as like a future project, starting up some spell work services and, and things like that. So currently no, but uh, in the future, definitely a possibility. Yeah, I looked at your Etsy shop and I'll put links in the description to, to all of your, your store and social media, but you had some pretty interesting uh, products on there. I like the, uh, the, what was it? The monetary oil that you had. Uh, that was pretty neat. So <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where did you grow up? So um, I grew up in a few different places. So I was born in Bristol, England. Um, my dad's British, my mom is Turkish and Azerbaijani, so I grew up in England, um, in Bristol, and also in Devon, um, and that's sort of where my dad's side is from as well. I grew up in Turkey as well, and in Baku in Azerbaijan, and then um, when I was a little bit older, but still a kid, I moved over to the U.S. with my mom, and I lived in Alaska for a little bit. Um, so all of those places were really instrumental to who I am today. Um, and Alaska, the, 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 the sort of natural beauty there is just incredible. And that's really where I started discovering the whole witchcraft and earth-based stuff. And it was the perfect place for exploring that. Right. Was there anything that you did not like about Alaska? The darkness, my God, the winter is <laughs> so long. I, I love darkness. I love rain. I love cold weather. But at a certain point after it stretches on for nine months, it gets it gets a little too much. Um, so that was the one thing for me. Um, and then also it is pretty small, which I like. I like the kind of slow living and stuff. But there are times when you kind of want to go out and, and do things. And that was very limited. Um, so, you know, with concerts, I think the biggest, the biggest band that came to Alaska in the entire, I think, five years I lived there were the Spin Doctors. So right? you know, <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't much opportunity for that sort of thing up there. <laughs> <laughs> and not a big draw when it comes to big concerts, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> So what did, what did you like or not like about England? 
I, I've, to me, England is like one of the places that feels the most like home, um, especially the West Country, because that's kind of where my side is from, the West Country and Wales. And um, it really, I, I do really love being there. Um, you know, I, I just, as soon as I step in there, it's like, I mean, I've lived in the US for so long, it does feel like I'm traveling somewhere new, but at the same time, it feels so familiar. Um, I love the, the, the historical buildings that you find. I love um, the variety of animal and plant life. You know, as soon as I stepped out from the London airport, I'll see like lavender growing in the middle of London. Like it's, it's great. Um, there isn't much I don't like about uh, being in the UK, if I'm honest, although um, it really depends where you're at, I feel like. So there are some parts that I really enjoy. And then um, there are some parts where I'll visit that people are not as friendly. So um, I went to Bath just for a day recently. And I did kind of get a kind of uh, unwelcoming vibe there, if I'm completely honest. And I'm sure some people have had great experiences there. It just wasn't my kind of place. So there are definitely some parts of the UK that, um, that I've been to that I haven't loved. But for the most part, I do love it there. So you spent time traveling recently. I, I looked at your uh, Instagram, very beautiful pictures. Can you share a little bit about that experience? Absolutely. So um, me and my dad were very close. Um, so he would usually come to the US to visit me. Um, and then this time I went over to the UK um, and it was had been about two years since I'd seen him in person because of COVID. So it had been a very long time. I, you know, I missed him so much. As soon as I saw him at the airport, I hugged him, I burst into tears. It was awesome. Um, and it was a really wonderful trip. We, uh, you know, I landed at Heathrow in London, and then we took a coach to Plymouth, and we spent some time there. We spent some time in Brixham. We spent some time in Boss Castle, where I went to the Museum of Witchcraft, which was awesome. Um, that had to be the highlight of the trip, to be honest. And um, we kind of just traveled around. We also went to Bristol. I saw some family members I hadn't seen in like a decade and a half, so that was that was pretty crazy. And we spent the last few days in London and um, it felt just, it, it was a very spiritual, um, it was rife with a lot of spiritual experiences. So we went to a lot of kind of pilgrimage type places, I guess you could say. We visited St. Necton's Glen. We visited uh, the Avery Stone Circle for the summer solstice. And then we also saw Silbury Hill and West Kennet Long Barrow there. And I uh, did have, we, we both had a very paranormal experience at uh, West Kent at Long Barrow where it was dusk on the summer solstice. So I'm sure that impacted uh, the, the energies and all of that. But we went in and the first thing we noticed is that there were birds in the sort of uh, caverns or the rooms or whatever. And um, they were just completely quiet. Like they were just staring at us and they weren't moving. They were just, they were alive, but they were just really just not acting like normal birds, which was the first thing. And then the deeper we went, I started seeing these visuals. Mind you, I was stone cold sober. Like I, you know, I wasn't on anything. I was seeing all these visuals and it was so dark. I couldn't see anything, but I could see these kind of shapes. I saw a face. We both saw a figure just kind of looming on the left. Um, at, in the same area um, and my dad heard some sounds I heard um, like ringing noise and then um, I started to feel faint and then we walked out and um, we just heard a bunch of crows and and it was just mist rolling over the fields and everything and we were both a little freaked out and amazed at the same time we walked back now, as we were walking back, the mist was gone, the crows were gone, we're like, that's so odd. And then when we got back to our accommodation where we were staying, uh, the light bulb in the living room started flickering. And we're like, okay, it's probably just going out. But if the other light bulbs start doing that, then that's a little weird. Well, next thing I know, the light bulb in my room starts flickering. And then that night he saw the light on the TV flashing and then the shower turned on by itself. 
And all these weird experiences were just, it was such an odd experience. I loved it, but it kind of freaked me out. Um, so that was also a highlight of my trip. Second highlight would definitely be Museum of Witchcraft in Boss Castle. It was such an amazing experience. I went to every exhibit, read every single one, you know, like really, I mean, I know you're only supposed to spend an hour in there, but I'm pretty sure I spent like three. And um, it was such a, it was just such a fascinating museum. And it really left me inspired in my practice as well. And uh, those were definitely the highlights of that trip, I would say. That sounds exciting. That That's pretty interesting, the paranormal type yeah. things. Do you have a theory of what was happening there by any chance? Was it just some frequency unrest or something? Or It is a burial site, and uh, people often went there to visit their dead as well, and it is sort of that it is sort of an area where death lies heavy. And so I definitely think there's a lot of spirit activity there. And I, it almost felt like, almost like a portal to the other world or something like that. So I definitely think the just, it's, it, it, it's been there for so long. It's been a burial chamber for so long. And there's been so many years for that energy to build up that uh, to me, it, it kind of felt like it was, it had opened up a portal into the other world. Um, and uh, it felt like I was being drawn into that different world um, before I got out of there. It was, it was truly an amazing experience. So you co-host a podcast, The Infernal Alchemy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you talk about on that podcast and and who your host or your co-host is yeah so um so me and my co-host we talk a lot about kind of left-hand path related topics but also general witchcraft and spirituality um just kind of whatever comes to mind uh, we have been on sort of an extended break because we've both been so busy um but you can still listen to it on uh, spotify or apple music or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, but yeah, we both practice kind of uh, left-hand path traditions. He, uh, he works with Dante Leon and Belial as well, and um, some other spirits. And so we kind of um, hit it off because our practices are quite similar in that way. Um, I think we had each other on each other's YouTube channels. And then we talked about it and decided to do the podcast. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how that came to be. And um, I'm hoping that at some point we can get back into uh, making making that, but uh, we'll see what happens with that. Well, good, good. Yeah, I watched a couple episodes of it. It's, it's good. I encourage you to stay with it. Good Thank stuff. You. Thanks. So you describe yourself as culturally Muslim. Can you kind of describe or explain what that is for our listeners and viewers? Absolutely. So to me, it's, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a widespread term or not. I, I do remember seeing it somewhere, but I, it definitely struck a note with me, um, something I could relate to in terms of you know, my mom's side of the family being uh, Muslim, but uh, I personally, obviously I don't practice Islam, but for me, I still um, have a cultural connection to it. So that is something that, um, it, it, it's definitely a unique thing, um, not just to Islam, obviously other, um, you know, religions have it, but um, when it comes to Islam being a sort of universal religion, but there's still a sort of cultural and ethnic um, aspect to it in a lot of instances. So, you know, for example, a lot of the um, folk remedies and a lot of the, you know, removal of the evil eye stuff that I grew up with is um, Islamic based. And that is still something that I connect to. It's still something, you know, I'll, I'll go over, see my grandma and then, you know, I'll let her do the whole evil eye removal thing. Um, so even though I don't practice Islam anymore, it's still something that is near and dear to my heart as part of my culture um, on that side of my family. 
you know, I think it's important to keep culture alive. You know, even if you may not subscribe to everything in it, I think it's important to keep that alive and keep that lineage because as I've tried to point out with this series of interviews, you can find something and take something away from anyone if you just keep your mind open and allow yourself to explore the possibilities. There's a lot of really good things that you can take a little here and a little here and a little here. And it's all about your individual journey. So anything that you can do to make that better, why not? It doesn't matter where it comes from. Yeah, there's a lot of richness to be found with that cultural connection. Um, I definitely encourage people if they feel drawn to it, to look into it because there's that real sense of community and there's also the folklore and all this history that you learn and there's so much richness that comes from it. Um, And I, I feel very lucky to have a close connection to both of my cultures that I grew up in um, and learning those stories and passing that down, maybe, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's, it's really, really a, a wonderful thing to have in your life, I think. I think so. So a lot of us on the left-hand path, especially those of us that are out public as, as you are, we experience attacks and trolls and things like that. Have you experienced very much of that in, in your, your journey? I definitely have. Um, my kind of strategy has been to avoid feeding the trolls for the most part. There are times where I'll get, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get a response or something that really pisses me off. But for the most part, it's, it, it, it's, it's easy to ignore, you know, the majority of it are YouTube comments, turn to Jesus Christ, Jesus loves you, God loves you, blah, 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 and I just remove, um, hide user from channel, that sort of thing, and I generally just, the more I ignore it, the better my life is, and the lower my stress levels are, so I try to keep it that way. Um, I have had a few uh, times where it's been not really related to my kind of the fact that I'm on the left-hand path or the fact that I practice witchcraft, but, you know, some kind of other online dispute. Um, There was a couple years ago on Twitter, of course, I posted something about tarot not being a closed practice. That was actually the worst one I've gotten. I had to private my account for like two or three days because I was getting harassment for it. And I was like, this is the, I thought this was one of the least controversial opinions I've ever posted, but apparently not. Um, but you know, with that, I, I've kind of learned to take it in stride as a part of being on the internet, as in, as a practicing occultist and just, just kind of push it to the side, remove the comments and, you know, you're not going to change people's minds. If, if they're, if they're out here commenting on people's pages, turn to Jesus Christ, they're too far gone for, for you to change their minds anyway, about being more open to other belief systems. So I've, I've just started ignoring them and I've been a lot less stressed since. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find that that's, that's a real good way to mitigate that is just delete or ignore and they will lose interest if you don't engage. And it's not that you're rolling over and letting them run over you. It's just that you know, my time is valuable. Your time is valuable. We don't have time to spend arguing with, you know, people that obviously are not going to listen to your point of view. They've already got their mind made up. So that's a good approach. Exactly. Not everyone's worth your time. Not every debate is worth your time. Um, and then, you know, the more I've been, I've matured over my time being on the internet, I've, I've started understanding that more, the concept of picking your battles wisely. It's not everything is worth your time. Like you said, our time is precious and, you know, our time is limited. So there's really no point. Right. And sometimes people will bait you at trying to get you to respond to something where they can turn that around on you. So it's, yeah just better to walk away. (laughs) Absolutely. I've even had some friends 
um, especially the ones who have like bigger followings where they'll get an outrageous comment and then they'll respond to it. And then the person will respond saying, oh, I was just trying to get a response out of you, you know, cause you've got so many followers. And it's like, you know, don't feed the trolls. They're, they're just there for attention. It's really not worth your time. True. Very true. Viv, how important is ritual to your path? Uh, I would say extremely important, um, especially as of late. I, I feel like it's something that really keeps me on my path. It creates a routine in a sense, but it also creates change. Um, especially, I mentioned before, with working with the Hecateon, there's a, when you first start it, there's a pretty intensive nine-day period of ritual each night. And I've noticed as I was doing that, um, I recently finished that this last new moon. Um, as I've been doing that, I've really felt a transformation internally. And um, I really feel like regular ritual has been instrumental to my growth as a practitioner and as a person. I feel like it's it, it feels very purifying for the mind, the soul, the body, but also you can really connect to those energies on a deeper level, um, those deities or those demons or whoever it is you work with, if, if, if any spirit on, on a much deeper level. And it's good practice. Um, it's really good practice. And I, I definitely feel like the longer I go without it, the more kind of rusty I feel when I get back into it. I, I don't know if that's a universal experience, but for me, uh, practice really makes things run more smoothly for me in ritual. And it's a little bit like exercise or dancing or whatever crafting or speaking a language, you know, um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So to me, ritual is a very big part of my practice and very important to me. Yeah, I feel I feel the same way. And I also that resonates with me what you said about you feel rusty or you you feel like you you just need to go and do a ritual, you know, it's, it is, it's a lot like working out or, or whatever. If you don't do it for a while, you kind of feel yourself kind of drifting a little bit. And so you have to go back to it. I agree with that. I'm glad I'm not the only one who, who has that. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. And I'm sure some of our listeners and viewers have experienced that as well. They'll probably tell us about that in the comments. Well, at yes. least I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you have for someone that is looking there they're looking at the left-hand path as we have all done and they're trying to figure out what's right for them what advice would you give them my number one I know it sounds obvious but it's easier said than done is keeping an open mind as much as you can um, if you grew up with, you know, Christianity and, you know, maybe a more extreme form where perhaps you were taught that these things are evil, you might have some fears to work through as I did, um, or another religion that teaches, you know, that that's evil or whatever. And um, that's important is working through your fear rather than running from it, because it's very tempting to look into the stuff, feel that discomfort in your gut. Um, when you first start out because of those ingrained beliefs and then, you know, run off and, and, and be like, okay, it's not for me. Um, just try to try to work through that. Think about, think really deeply about why you're feeling this way, you know, and, and then it'll start to kind of uncover your sort of underlying subconscious beliefs. At least it did for me, um, just speaking from experience. So that's, that's the most important thing for me. And then secondly, look into everything. There's so many things you can look into. There's um, different forms of theistic Satanism, demonolatry, Luciferianism. Um, you could work with one specific spirit and really get to know that spirit. You could, it, whatever works for you, you know, for some people, it's kind of exposing themselves to all sorts of different spirits just to get the feel of things and, um, also guided meditations are great. You know, that's one of the things that really helped me when I was starting out to really feel out the energy, find a really good guided meditation, um, you know, connecting 
there's ones connecting with Lilith, there's ones connecting with Lucifer, there's ones connecting with Satan, there's ones connecting with uh, Hecate, all, I've done all of these. And um, when you're first starting out with the spirit work aspect of it, that's really helpful. Um, and really think about what your uh, values are and how they might shift as you go through this um, path and maybe a transformation and just really, yeah, keep open mind, see if, see if it is for you and give it a chance before you really uh, kind of reject it. Um, that's kind of my advice, I guess. Good advice. Absolutely. So the last question that I always ask, is there anything that you would like to tell our listeners and viewers about that we haven't covered tonight? Um, so um, on my YouTube channel, I did talk a little bit about my um, paranormal experience at West Kent at Long Barrow while I was in England. Um, I have another one as well that occurred there. So my next video is going to be about my paranormal experiences while I was there, including the one I talked about. So if you're interested in hearing more, you can definitely look out for that uh, at some point, hopefully soon, definitely soon. Um, and yeah, uh, that's really about it for me. Uh, I've been working a lot on various different things. Um, we already mentioned my shop, which I launched like yesterday <laughs> as of this <laughs> recording. So, you know, um, <laughs> But uh, I'm, I'm definitely excited to, to get to work on more projects and stuff like that, creating more tangible things as well as videos and, uh, you know, um, working through my practice as well. You know, like we said, ritual, um, working through this Hecateon book, um, which I, I might make some videos about as well. And yeah, that's really, that's really all for me that I can think of right now. I will definitely go over and check out those videos. I'm excited to hear more about that. Thank you so that's much. That's going to be good. And one thing I forgot to mention is you have a Patreon as well. So I'm going to put the links, all of those links, plus your Patreon in the bottom uh, in the description. And I encourage everyone go and check out Viv's work. And we have to support those people that are making good content on the left-hand path. So if you can help, please help, because every little bit helps, as they say. So Viv, thank you so much for spending time with me tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lovely conversation. I enjoyed it. And for those of you at home listening and watching, this has been Alistair Knott. Hail Satan.